despite what some people may try to tell you, we're all human, at least most of us are. There are many shared experiences that overlap in everybody's story, and everyone's lives tend to feature a pursuit of romantic satisfaction. This is also the case for Boglums, as they tend to share some traits with humans despite their distinct differences from evolved apes. As we are all comfortably aware of at this point, King Cobra JFS is a highly regarded and renowned Boglum that is just doing his best, dude, even if it means drinking himself into a blackout spastic rage. Many exceptionally talented people have come together to chronicle the day-to-day -day happenings in the Cobraverse, making it easier than ever to peer into the life of something that teeters on the edge of humanity. Thanks to the work of these fine people, I have been able to sit down and organize a list of Cobra's love interests from over the years, starting with innocent puppy love, questionable actions by his homeboy Alex, and the windy scented stench from Jessica's mucus hatch. Before we can dive into the juiciest bits regarding Josh's love of the ladies, we should definitely go over the most significant lover he's ever had. The one that would leave the most distinct impression on him from experience, Stephanie. She was Cobra's longest lasting partner, spanning two whole years. Pretty short for some people, pretty long for people with wet brains. They met at Job Corps, hitting it off strong considering they were both very frumpy, which honestly made them a good pair. Cobra had been bullied for most of his life, and feared that Job Corps was going to be just as bad as his time in public schooling. Thankfully, Stephanie showed Josh that not everybody is awful, and someone was willing to give him a chance. Maybe this was the first step he needed toward getting his life on track. After all, the right lover can make all the difference in someone's life. Stephanie was not the first girl that Josh had set his misaligned peepers on, as he had crushed on a few girls prior to claiming her snatch. In fact, she wasn't even his first choice, but thankfully a girl named Brittany dodged that bullet. Brittany was initially disgusted by Josh, but began to warm up to him, at least according to Josh's interpretation of events. She unfortunately left Job Corps right before he could make his move, leaving him with a broken heart. This pain was subdued when Cobra's friend, Amy, proposed introducing him to her friend Stephanie, who fancied Josh. Unsure but willing to gamble, Jord agreed to meet with the mystery girl, being smitten by the thought of meeting somebody who was on the same level as him. On April 16, 2012, Josh and Stephanie began dating. Just four days later, on 420 of all days, the gothic bad boy claimed that she gave him some hand relief, and he treated her lady bits to some personal one-on-one -on -one care. On May 6th, she finally gave up her fur burger and let him bruise it a tiny bit, if he was even capable of doing so anyway. They performed this act of fervorous passion in a restroom, lasting about 2 minutes and 46 seconds, and of course the interaction was recorded on an iPod. Thankfully for all of us, the video was lost to time. They would, however, have relations on campus several times after this happened. When discussing his experiences with Stephanie, Josh recalled that Stephanie saw him as the bad boy of Job Corps, whatever the hell that actually means. For all intents and purposes, Josh was just a socially awkward kid who just did his own thing and grossed out everybody around him. I mean, maybe she was talking about how he smelled, so maybe she was kind of right. First, she said, and I quote, she was attracted to me because he looked like the bad boy of Job Corps. Honey, I was the bad boy of Job Corps. Everyone at Job Corps knew who the fuck I was. They were like, yeah, Saunders. This relationship would continue to grow, blossom, evolve, and eventually mutate into something kind of beautiful. Or at least, it depends on how you look at it. Unfortunately for the lovebirds, stress would eventually be placed upon their connection when Josh got caught smoking the devil's lettuce while at Job Corps, which led to his dismissal for obvious reasons. This situation put unnecessary strain on the relationship because they would have to deal with their urges from a distance, as Cobra's father Clint had to pick up his boy and bring him back home. Stephanie expressed interest in dropping out of school so she could be with him, but Josh told her to keep working towards her education and future endeavors for careers, because he screwed up and he didn't want her to follow in his footsteps. All things considered, this was a very mature response for him. After Cobra returned to Casper, Wyoming and Stephanie found herself with breaks away from her education, she would visit him for brief periods. These visits allowed the relationship to continue to bloom, accelerating its inevitable downfall. These two were gradually starting to become a poor match for each other, as Stephanie was continuously maturing and figuring out her life, while Josh opted to do whatever it is he does. Can anybody blame her for moving on when her boyfriend was routinely mixing energy drinks and beer for internet points and personal satisfaction, on top of nearly burning down his apartment with his backwards cooking? God damn it! Cobra was unsurprisingly the one to fumble this relationship by cheating on Stephanie. 
According to recollections of the story found online, Cobra and his buddy Couch Chris were at a gas station when they were both approached by a resident lot lizard. She was pregnant and proposed knocking boots with both of the boys in exchange for some smokes. The duo racked around the idea in their brains for a bit, both coming to the conclusion that porking a pregnant woman in a parking lot was a good idea. I'd imagine the two tag-teamed the lady, having their fornication session in the back of Chris's van of love. For Casper, this is merely a typical outing for copulation, a sight not uncommon for the area. I do wonder if they drove to a different location to get down to business, or if they kept it parked near a gas pump. So many possibilities for degeneracy that we'll likely never get answers to. But alas, I have to ask why he chose to do this. Sure, there's the age-old thing about a stiff penis having no conscience, but he had a girlfriend that he claimed that he loved, and she loved him. Perhaps things were brewing within the relationship that encouraged him to seek pleasure and gratification outside of their pairing. Either way, it definitely wasn't a smart move on his part. I mean, where else is he going to find a woman who will stomach his disgusting bog slop, endure hours upon hours of cringy, boring conversation loops, can stomach the scent of his overpriced preferred soap, and of course receive his bog seed? She was truly the best he was going to get, which is pretty sad, because she appears to be mediocre at best. Additionally, why cheat on her with something like that? But for what exactly? For a lot lizard? Where's the logic in that? If I was with someone and they cheated on me with someone that had about as much teeth as a jack-o'-lantern, I'd probably have a legendary meltdown. She later informed him that she had cheated on him in retaliation, allowing someone other than him to explore her tailpipe with her tallywhacker. This, of course, angered the rock star villain, causing him to make offhand remarks about having angry hanky-panky with her. With the two constantly seeking stimulation outside of the confines of their relationship, it was merely a matter of time before the dynamic duo would split. As expected, their relationship ended not long after the reveal. This ultimately was the best thing for Stephanie, but for Cobra, he unknowingly just stepped away from the highest point of his dating career. Hard to believe it, but he was going to hit lower than rock bottom. In the years that have passed since their relationship went up in flames, Stephanie has come forward via YouTube videos discussing her past interactions with the gothic bad boy. This was really just a ploy for her to get attention because she let a smelly regarded individual shoot bog butter in or on her. If I were in her position, I would simply memory hole getting my holes filled by him rather than bring it up whenever convenient or applicable. To each their own, I suppose. Most, if not all of Stephanie's viewers only check out her content because of her ties with the Cobro. She knows this, which is precisely why she uploads videos centered around Josh. Cobra has responded to her videos, calling her a quote, clout whore, and pointing out that her only claim to fame is that he is her ex. You're such a clout whore. It's the truth. Like, your, your ex-boyfriend's more famous than you are on YouTube, and the only reason you're doing YouTube is to ride my coattails. You can't tell me you do YouTube because you enjoy it. Later in her videos, she pokes fun at his diet and his filthy cabinets. Angered by the attacks against his pantry, Cobra brought up that she has an embarrassing photo of herself and her knockers floating around online, making snide remarks about her udders being near a turd-stained toilet. He can say whatever he wants because at the end of the day, he put those things in his mouth at one point and he was happy to brag about it. Okay, she wants to talk about how gross my cabinet is or how gross my stove is. Let's talk about how gross your titty selfie was. There's a picture of Stephanie with her titties out, which I'll give compliments where compliments are due. Stephanie's got some nice titties. When she's taking a selfie next to a dirty ass fucking poop stained toilet and you want to give me shit about how my stove looks. Stephanie has expressed irritation with Josh's behavior since their breakup, upset that he claimed that her coochie wasn't up to snuff. He said she supposedly was trying to stop other girls from talking to him and she also had daddy issues of some kind. However, Jord never properly elaborated on this. I'd wager if she was contacting women he was talking to, she was likely warning them of his disingenuous behavior. You should always take what he says with a grain of salt. In fact, I recommend you take some time to really consider the possible credibility of this next story. Josh tried to say that some people that knew Stephanie tried to show up at his work when he was still working at Wendy's. You know, when he was mixing up tea and squashing baby birds with a bicycle tire. The individuals allegedly had a weapon or two in hopes of causing bodily harm. There is no evidence of this having happened, and quite frankly, it sounds like a typical tall tale that a pill-popping Casper resident would come up with to add some excitement to the workday. The second thing I found out is that that little drama that happened with me last night about people showing up to my work to try to confront me. Apparently, the people that were going to threaten to kick my ass or whatever, the people that were trying to kick my ass over some drama on... The people who were trying to kick my ass over some drama on Facebook 
two of the people were too fucking scared to fight me by themselves. So these two individuals end up bringing a fucking gun with a round in the chamber concealed to my place of business. And uh, they thought I was working on Saturday, so they were going to wait for me to go on a cigarette break and they were going to confront me. It's truly a shame that their relationship fell apart the way it did. They seem to be happy together on video, at least as best as we can read from their awkward mannerisms. But, as with all things in life, they were lessons for each other. I just hope Josh understood everything he was taught. <laughs> wait, who am I kidding? He didn't learn a thing. But that's all okay, because going through a relationship that fell apart is just part of growing as a person, a shared experience among most humans. I say most because I'm sure a few people watching this video had even less success than Jord. Continuing forward, he once had a short-lived romance with a woman named Judy. He initially just name-dropped her on a video, talking about how he was able to court some more strange for his stink meat. His fans told him to bring her on video to prove that she actually existed, unlike his many nonsensical fabrications he's shared before. Of course, like the obedient boy he is, on January 3rd, 2015, he brought her on the show to share with the wider internet. A stunningly intelligent decision. I'm not even gonna hog all the camera, right? What happened, you fucker? <laughs> so. <laughs> what up, people? <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> Name the time and the place. You, we're on camera! And your point? You're a dick. Yeah, we're on your dick. Fuck everybody. <laughs> Uh, I'm hyper, so... Yeah... <laughs> right off the bat, we can tell she is incredibly hyperactive and follows the old lol so random mindset commonly seen among autistic girls on the internet during the late 2000s and early 2010s. Turns out Invader Zim caused more psychological damage to easily impressionable people than once initially thought. <laughs> but I'm also good, because girl loves cupcakes. And waffles, and tacos, and burritos. <laughs> Measure for the cupcake! <laughs> yeah, y'all. <laughs> what? I watch too much. I watch too much Invader Zim. Oh, Invader Zim! Yes! Uh, I'm yes. Gur! Gur! I'm Gur! <laughs> Get it? I'm Gur! Okay, you can be Gur. I'm Gur. <laughs> gur of cupcakes. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhat pointless, but her last name is Osborne, or at least that's what Cobra claimed it was. This was likely an attractive feature of hers that he was drawn to because of Ozzy, dude. I'm starting to think he gets turned on at the thought of Ozzy Osborne's belligerent mumbly rambles. You know what's funny about that too is one of my girlfriend's name was Judy. Her last name was Osborne, and I got a chuckle out of that. Oh, I had fun with her. She was fun. Judy was a mother of three who was not fit to take care of any child. From what I've been able to gather, she preferred to go partying instead of taking care of her kids. And of course, she just had to introduce her crotch spawn to Cobra. Her youngest child, who was about four months old at the time, allegedly started calling Cobra dad, but I feel compelled to question the legitimacy of that statement. Her kids were taken away from her after a routine of neglect and possible direct abuse. Hopefully, her kids are doing better these days. Even more adorably, her kids started calling me daddy, even though I wasn't her her birth dad, you know. I'm just that great with people under a certain age. On January 14th of 2015, Cobra announced that he was once again single, as Judy had pretty much ruined the opportunity of a prosperous relationship. The breakup was at least amicable, without any nasting falling out or screaming match. Their bond rotted away because they were both young and immature, which is totally normal. Unfortunately for Josh, he claimed that Judy would flirt with other men in front of him. This is actually a totally reasonable justification to call off the relationship. She wasn't taking it seriously, so why should he? If you saw my um, Facebook post, unfortunately me and Judy are currently split up. It sucks, but what are you going to do, right? Um, at least Judy's being super cool about it, understanding. That's what's up, you know what I'm saying? What caused me to break up with Judy is she would flirt with other dudes right in front of me while I was helping her raise her her kid that the last piece of shit couldn't stick around for. Not too long after the relationship with Judy ended, Josh entered yet another short-lived fling with a girl named Amy in late February of 2015. When I say short-lived, I literally mean short, like only a single day of being together, if you can even call 24 hours a relationship. This was arguably the most successful relationship he's ever had, because it didn't drag out longer than necessary. There was some seemingly human interaction and it all just fizzled out. I mean really, can you even call it one if it didn't survive a single day? Let's be real here. 
This did not phase him, running right off his back like suds from his tactical soap. As it turns out, that was, and I say was, my third girlfriend and fourth sex partner. Man, shit happens as they say. Considering how Josh spoke about Amy, she was your typical Casper dweller. She lived a relatively trashy lifestyle, much like most of the people Josh has befriended over the years, and as such treated him and others like garbage. Granted, we only know what we do know of her from Josh's word of mouth, he likely wasn't entirely lying here. It's not hard to believe that somebody from Wyoming can be a little brusque. For one, she had several guy friends and Cobra is admittedly a jealous person. He couldn't trust her because of the way she was interacting with said friends, such as taking shotgun hits with men, which is when two people lock lips and one of them blows smoke into the other's mouth, thus sharing the controlled substance. Can't say I blame him for being upset by this. Couple things that led to the breakup, one of which was way too many guy friends and I'm kind of a jealous person. Second thing is, when you're smoking with somebody and that somebody just happens to be doing shotgun hits with their ex, you see what I'm saying? Like, you're supposed to be broken up with somebody and, yeah, no, fuck that. Okay, I'm done. Done with it. Don't care anymore. She was always bugging him, saying she was bored constantly. She was testing Cobra's patience, unaware of his demonic wrath. If you're intending to stay at somebody's place for an extended period of time, perhaps you would come to expect that they aren't always obligated to keep you entertained 24-7. Some personal accountability can go a long way. When he finally broke up with her and told her to get out of his place, she freaked out, asking why he was doing this and complained that she had nowhere else to go. Sounds to me like she was just using Cobra for a place to sleep. People like that tend to have very little self-respect, let alone compassion for other people. Shockingly, yet again, Josh made a mature decision. Oh, and she was not happy about it either. She's like, are you really going to kick me out? I have nowhere to go. <laughs> you know, and then, of course, she goes out drinking with some of her friends at her friend's house. And it's like, and she's there all fucking night. Comes back the next day, drunk as shit. And it's like, you know what? He obviously, you know, and she claims she's got people looking out for her and watching her and shit. Well, I'm sure they'll take her in. She'll sit there and, wah, 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 all guys are the same, man. Don't get me wrong, the sex was awesome. I was able to hit it and quit it at least once. But at the same time, okay, I didn't, I did not feel a very strong mental connection to her. You see what I'm saying? Some time would pass before Josh stopped licking his wounds long enough to finally land himself another hole to fill. Joshua's friend Jeremy hooked him up with a girl that he felt would be a good match for him. In came Summer, a self-proclaimed infertile and a scully. Scullies are furries that have skulls for a face, because why not complicate something that is already beyond meaningless? To top it off, she was an absentee mother with no real legal rights to her child, as they were taken away, which, you know, is kind of a typical thing in Casper. Maybe I should speak nicer about that town. Oh well. She has a quote, slow learning disability in PTSD, which I'm not going to poke fun at because I legitimately believe it probably holds some merit. Summer's influence in Josh's life is kind of a weird topic, because she didn't seem to leave a lasting impression on him as far as romantic intent goes. But she did help him realize his personal presentation by bringing his Ozzy Osbourne knuckle tattoos to life. She did them herself, but unfortunately they rubbed off because ink markers don't leave long-lasting inscriptions on flesh. I don't believe she actually properly tattooed his hands, and if she did actually use the required tools, she sucked dick at the task and shouldn't be given a tool to pierce someone's flesh and spit dye into their skin. However, she did fix this problem at a later point. Yeah, I don't know how this happened, honestly. Like, it was doing just fine. It was doing just fine earlier, and now my fucking tattoo's fading. What the shit? This is the first time I've had a tattoo fade on me like this. God damn it, dude. I know, right? Like, God damn it, dude. It's my fucking Aussie ink, and it's fucking fading god damn it dude and i didn't notice it till just now i'm just like what I, I literally did not notice it until just now i'm just like what the shit josh revealed to the world that he had finally planted his pecker in some of age consenting alive cisgendered poon tang for the first time in a little while his means of sharing this news was facebook where he declared that he pounded that shit with a post that not only his friends could see but his family as well Clint was unfortunate enough to witness the post, learning about the promiscuous habits of his son. It happens. 
Josh's friend group caused many problems for Summer and Josh, particularly homeboy Scotty and an individual known as Mr. Goat, or Steve if you're a normal person. They all got involved in some stupid, uninteresting, and genuinely boring drama that ultimately amounted to nothing. Somebody impersonated another person on Facebook, there were dumb squabbles over what he said versus what she said, someone wanted to bone another person, all the makings of a needlessly stretched out nothing burger internet war. Summer wanted to sue this Steve guy over harassment and a bunch of other dumb things. Some way or another, Summer started experiencing medical issues, specifically bronchitis and strep throat. Been there before, definitely not fun. She would begin to visit Josh less and less because of her fluctuating health and work schedule. In December of 2017, Summer claimed that her Facebook account had been hijacked and pictures of her child were removed from the site. This, coupled with the harassment from trolls, family, public fighting, everything, compounded into a stressful situation for her, causing her to suggest that she was contemplating ending it all. This all eventually culminated in her breaking things off with Cobra. She did, however, want to remain friends with Josh, but his ego, of course, was a factor that just had to get in the way, claiming that she couldn't handle dating a renowned internet celebrity such as himself. Angry Grandpa, a larger YouTuber, happened to pass away on the very same day that their relationship crumbled, and Josh opted to cry over the end of AGP's life. Again, I've been there, bro. Angry Grandpa was a significant influence on my life, too, but I really can't say that was a good thing. Summers shared that she was sexually assaulted the day before she broke up with Josh, with Cobra thinking she didn't want to be touched anymore because sex with him was just too good. Like his dirty, gothic penis rocked her world beyond anything she'd ever be able to handle again. He did find out later what happened to her, and apparently she caught a venereal disease. How nice of him to share that with the internet. When Summer texted Jeremy, she couldn't touch anyone or be touched, you know. I didn't know what to think of it. I went on this ego trip thinking it was because my sex was just that good. Come to find out it was something completely different and the results of the sexual assault, you know, caused Summer to get something that she has to get antibiotics for. This is what I would call an example of it could be worse. Josh would continue to search for a mate, as his biological imperative to spread his seed would be the driving force behind his existence. Well, that and getting blackout drunk, but that is to be expected. He made friends with two older Casper residents by the name of Walt and Angie. I guess hanging out with people his age is too complicated. These two are an elderly couple that have been together for a long time and have shared many, many experiences together, including hanging out with Cobra for some reason. What made these two so alluring to Cobra, other than their easy access to pills that he could pop in his mouth like their candy, was their daughter, Ellen. With Ellen in the picture, he'd have to work his gothic magic to make her be smitten by him, because his looks and demeanor have always been questionable at best. He had to use good old-fashioned lying and manipulation tactics, which might have worked if he was a bit more normal. But how could he do this? How could he pull this off? What would be his angle? He'd have to plan his work and work his plan. His dry spell would eventually have to come to an end at some point, right? He got his foot in the door when he purchased Christmas dinner for Angie, Walt, and of course Ellen. This was some of the $1,000 slump of cash that YouTube had deposited into Josh's bank account due to his AdSense earnings. Taking care of somebody's family basically warrants their daughter pays you back with coochie, at least according to Cobra. Unfortunately for Josh, Ellen already had somebody she would regularly allow to plow her, and Cobra wasn't really up to snuff as far as replacements go, so she opted to stay friends with him. Selfish bitch, he bought her family's Christmas dinner. It's like the rules, you know, you're not supposed to break them. How you gonna accuse me of being jealous of you and your so-called fuck buddy, boyfriend, whatever the fuck friend you're calling him? I'm the one that helped provide Christmas dinner. Josh's tactic was to subvert expectations. Everybody assumes he's a stinky, feeble-minded boglum, but he was really working the system to get what he wanted. To him, relationships and dating are a series of long cons that require nurturing to successfully pull off, which, of course, he believed he was doing. The entire purchase of Christmas dinner was a sore spot for him, as he claimed that Ellen should be kinder to him because of the loving gesture he and his trolls had financed. Using his logic, she not only owed him a crack at her crack, but his entire fan base as well, because they were so generous as to give Cobra the money to help out his homeboys and home girls. I guess her fate was to be the Cobra community's bicycle. He was convinced that Ellen secretly had a crush on him, but she was too shy and afraid to confess how she really felt. This is just another instance of Josh being delusional, as we know most women really don't want to be near him, at least in the way that he believes they want to. You know, and I think certain people have a crush on me and certain people are afraid to admit their true feelings. That's why certain people act the way they do around me. <laughs>
She allegedly, and I can't stress allegedly enough, said that Josh quote stole her heart but she quote didn't want to date him, she only saw him as a friend. This irked him as he had had his sights set on her for quite a while, but I guess that also meant she should have been appreciative of the fact. Josh went on to say that people treat him like he's stupid because he's autistic, not giving him the credit he deserves for his unmatched intellect. This was all part of his plan, as he used the guise of being a moron to get one over on others, at least that's what he tried to claim. At a later point, Ellen created a Facebook post in hopes of helping to raise money for Old Friend's Senior Dog Sanctuary, as Facebook often prompts its users to use the notoriety of their own birthdays to give back to the community or organizations that can do some good. This sanctuary provides assistance to elderly dogs that have either aged with difficulty or suffer from medical ailments. Just so conveniently, Josh saw this opportunity as a means to show Ellen that he really cared about her and he could get shit done, like an of-age mature adult. Cobra hosted a contest on his channel in order to assist Ellen by giving money to the aforementioned nonprofit service. Unsurprisingly, Josh had no money to spare, leaving it up to his fans to send in money to win him brownie points with Angie's daughter. This wasn't about helping anybody or any dogs, this was about helping him get in Ellen's pants. The terms of the contest were simple, whoever gave the most money would be handsomely rewarded by the Cobro, receiving a signed copy of Hell's Advocate, which was a slew of shitty music that Josh tossed together, and a custom-made Cobra Craft wand. Judging by the box the copy of Hell's Advocate was in, it appeared to be a cassette tape, you know, a media format that has long since been abandoned by people due to other more viable formats like CDs and digital downloads having become the norm. Josh basically used these rewards as bait to garner donations. If the donation goals weren't met, the rewards would have to be shelved. Such a dire situation. Trolls poked the boy with a stick, pointing out that Josh was merely trying to slide his meat into Ellen's slit. But the gourd pushed back. He wasn't trying to do anything like that. He just wanted to help Ellen and the poor elderly dogs, because he cares so much. When this wasn't enough motivation for his fans to start throwing money at him, Josh offered to lift weights and play guitar wearing only a pair of tight-fitting green cock holster underpants. Eventually, the goal was met, because the trolls really wanted to see Josh wear some unflattering attire. Josh still proceeded to donate $10 of his own money because he really wanted to help his homegirl. Josh and his fans allegedly helped Ellen save 85 dogs. Not sure if that number is legit or not, but I do hope some good came out of this. Cobra did get in contact with the contest winner and worked out the details of how they wanted their wand to look. Of course, this didn't go as smoothly as it should have, as Josh mistakenly sent the wand to the wrong address. Seems like mistakes and dissatisfaction were a trend of the LN saga. His next attempt to court her involved getting enough money to purchase tickets to a Black Veil Brides concert, particularly ones that sported backstage passes so his female friend could meet the band and all that fun stuff. He admitted right away that a female friend of his loves the band, and he gave the band a listen because she liked them. This couldn't possibly be a ploy from him to make it seem like they have something in common, right? Totally not. No way! The Black Veil Brides concert is March 23rd. My friend Ellen really wants to see Black Veil Brides in concert. She wants front row seats and backstage passes, which are easily a hundred some odd dollars a piece. When this didn't happen, Cobra moved on to fishing for sympathy bucks so he could get her a birthday card with a gift card inside of it and a one-of-a-kind shirt from Teespring. The gift card was actually for him, which he received on Christmas from his folks the previous month but he had decided it would be best if he re-gifted it to her, because he's such a caring soul. Cobes had a sneaking suspicion that Ellen would prefer to go to the concert with her fuck buddy slash boyfriend, another man who wasn't Josh could possibly accompany her on a romantic outing. But he was content with this because he just wanted her to be happy. The trolls proceeded to call him a simp, which he was not a fan of. Trolls often needle Josh by posing as Ellen in his stream chats, even to this very day. He's never fallen for these attempts by believing they're her. However, he makes sure to let people know that he's far too smart to fall for fake accounts, so really he's just giving them what they want in the long run. Ellen has left a significant mark on Josh, influencing something as important to him as his wand-making business. She is actually the reason why he wraps his painted sticks with string or yarn or twine, because she suggested that he should do that to improve their overall quality. She even gave him some string to give it a whirl with, and he was pretty happy with the end result. This is still a practice he does to this day, excluding the fact that he broke his wand-making lathe and subsequently slowed down on his wand production. Needless to say, they still look like total crap. Yeah, my friend Ellen, she gave me the idea. She's like, you should try something different with your wands, you know? Maybe you could try, like, wrapping string around the wand, and, you know, doing different colors. And I was like, hell yeah, homegirl, that's a 
awesome idea. Eventually, this would-be relationship fizzled out, with Cobra still periodically visiting homegirl Angie and homeboy Walt and occasionally catching passing glimpses of Ellen from time to time. He was never in her pants, she never birthed Jason Voorhees Saunders, and the cycle continued as it always did, uninterrupted. He would continue to make advances toward Ellen by showing up and spontaneously hanging with her folks, giving her no window of easy escape. Because a man in his 30s hanging out with the elderly just to see a woman his age doesn't send any bad signals, right? Josh defended his actions by saying he just enjoyed the friendship he had with Ellen's parents. His true intentions are obvious to anybody with a cursory knowledge of Boglums and their behavior. It just so happens that this certain female's parents like hanging out with me. And to me, it's about me and the parents' friendship. It's not about, I can't help it if her dog, if they're, if the, if the chicken questions parents like hanging out with me. I'm not trying anything, to be quite honest with you. And I've pretty much left her alone since the whole bite-sized cobra bullshit went down, you know? But can I help it if her dad likes hanging out with me? No, I cannot. And I quote, Josh, get your smoky badass down here. This is Walt. Bye. Cheers. He even stated that when she shows up at her parents' place, Josh gives her the cold shoulder. He doesn't look at her, say anything to her, let alone acknowledge her existence in any way, shape, or form. Trolls would continue to impersonate Ellen and call out Cobra's stalkerish tendencies, which he's certainly not a fan of. One time, Cobra went live from Angie's place, and the trolls called her home phone number. Over and over and over. Cobra wouldn't stop streaming either. He just had to stick it to those fucking loser trolls that are so obsessed with Cobra, because he rules their sad lives. You know, at the expense of the sanity of his elderly homies. People will just Hello? say no one wants. No, you cannot put a fucking goddamn call on my phone. This is Angie. Enough. Yeah, dude, that's how pathetic you are. You're gonna harass a bunch of old people because you hate King Cobra that much? That just shows you how fucking sad my trolls are, dude. Holy shit. Maybe for now, we should spin back the clock a bit in order to potentially understand the origins of Cobra's interest in women. Like most young boys, Cobra was fascinated with girls and the female figure because of the hormones that were flowing in him. Little guy was probably glazing most surfaces in his room at this point in his life. When Cobra was still in school, he had a crush on a popular girl named Alicia Rohde. She was renowned for her looks and her other pleasant features. Josh, of course, believed that they'd be a good match for each other because of his own false bravado. Cobra has claimed to have asked out many girls when he was in school, starting as early as the fourth grade, and has been consistently turned down time and time again. Alicia, however, stands out because she was a popular girl that broke the Boglum's heart. Interestingly, she isn't goth or anything close to that in a fashion or presentation sense. She's your typical conventionally attractive blonde girl that we've all seen many times, and usually girls like her don't end up with boys like Joshua. Her looks left a lasting impression on him, because he still brings her up every so often on his drunken streams, which usually gets him called a sicko and we know how he feels about that. In fact, when describing her looks, he said she's so attractive that even a gay guy would notice her, because that makes sense, right? Like, Alicia Rohde is so fucking hot that even a gay guy would notice. I'm just saying. <laughs> Despite her not finding him to be attractive when they were in school, there was a time where she supposedly went to a bar-slash-liquor-store combo shop and Josh happened to notice her, or at least what he believed was her. Cobra eyed her up and down, admiring her body, but then he kinda sorta didn't recognize her face, but he also kinda did. He wasn't exactly sure. Of course, because he wears tactical soap, she thought he smelled good and was sexy. I'm sure the story was grounded in reality. He wouldn't lie like that, dude. I could have swore I saw Alicia Rohde at the bar one time. And I stepped over to the liquor store portion of it to get me some alcohol and some cigarettes. And there was this cute blonde standing next to me. And I had my tactical soap on. And I elevated her elevator eyes i was like damn she's fine and then when i focused on her face i'm like you look familiar literally she was just beaming at me like hey how you doing i'm still sexually attracted to alicia Rohde. that's just what it is i'm not gonna try anything to be honest he also believes that she regrets rejecting him in high school because of his high-quality gender relations rants. I'm sure she weeps uncontrollably about that every single night. He tried hitting on her in hopes of possibly making her swoon, but as expected, much like most of the women that had interacted with Jord prior, she wasn't exactly impressed by his looks or personality. He really does shoot for women who were noticeably out of his league. 
He doesn't regret shooting his shot with her because he's a goddamn alpha. The fact he was turned down by a pretty girl made the rejections from less attractive women easier to deal with, at least according to him. He honestly believes that if it wasn't for the trolls, he would have a higher chance of being with women that he crushed on, as if his outwardly negative traits would be non-existent if the trolls didn't give him grief. Even after the years that have passed since she turned him down, he's been keeping a rather close eye on her. On May 7, 2023, he confirmed to have seen a photo of her talking about how she wasn't ashamed about her curves. He even said in his own words that she was voluptuous. She had allegedly received a handful of nasty comments left under the post from jealous women and men who wanted to give her their meat. Cobes, however, stated that he was happy for her, defending her right to be skinny and attractive and all the things that go with that. In his crossed eyes, she's an icon for body positivity. Not trying to spurg out here, but this chick Alicia Rohde that I knew going to high school with, very curvy woman, not necessarily fat by any means, but she's got, you know, voluptuous curves. She posted a picture of herself on the internet with her blonde hair and pigtails on either side and a bra and panties showing off her curves and she captioned the photo with, I'm not ashamed of my curves. And the hate comments on her photo, it was just like, 95% of them were probably all jealous ass chicks who wish they could look that good, and the other 5% were dudes who wish they could tap it. Despite not being a sicko and hating people that stalk women, Joshua can't stop himself from checking on her socials to keep tabs on the one who got away, if you could even really call her that. She escaped and probably doesn't realize how lucky she is in that regard. She never fell for the advances of a rock star. Considering what happened to the girl we're going to talk about next, she really did luck out. Brace yourself, because Cobra shows some real lack of tact here. Josh's love of the female form has been a pervasive trait of his for many years now, and as such he got to explore his interests one fateful night many years ago with a girl that likely really couldn't consent. I should preface that this story is told from his perspective, so he may have been leaving out some important details, but it certainly doesn't paint him in a good image regardless of how you view it. This was your one warning, I'm going in. Josh felt his first set of tatas when he was in junior high. Turns out the girl he felt up was special needs, much like himself, so they had some kind of common ground which is integral if you're trying to court somebody. Josh, one of his friends, and this girl were in the woods during a hot summer afternoon, doing what all responsible teenagers do, circumventing the laws most of us have mutually agreed upon. He glanced over at the girl during a conversation, asking her if he could do a bit of exploratory investigative work on her like a gentleman. The girl lifted up her shirt, which enlightened Josh the magnificence of women's jumblies. He gave them a consensual squeeze as opposed to violating her trust, because he's a considerate man. He went in to give her a kiss, but she backed away. His breath was likely a contributing factor to her decision to avoid a smooch. Because of her apprehensive response to locking lips with a rock star villain, he whipped out his willy and began whacking one off right in front of her and his friend. He kept going, proceeding to shoot ropes in front of them both. The girl allegedly said, and I quote, Hey, make that white stuff come out again. I kinda sorta have some doubts about the validity of that statement. Cobra described this moment as innocent experimentation. There's no way to sugarcoat this, but he took advantage of a special needs girl. Of course, he only confessed to this story once he had an adequate amount of booze in his system. But hey, you know. He blamed this partly on his built-up frustrations, because every girl up to that point had rejected him. So he had to talk a disabled girl into revealing herself and watch him yeet his meat. He really did his best to make himself sound like he was innocent in this scenario, but it just didn't work. The damage has already been done. I got to feel what boobies feel like when I was in junior high. And it was with, with a nice, lovely girl. It was totally consensual. We were both special needs. We were hanging out with a friend of mine. We were hanging out in the forest. It was a hot summer's afternoon before the school year. And all I did was ask literally the chick that I was talking with, hey, can you show me your boobs, please? And she lifted up her shirt, and it was just like, you never forget your first pair of boobs, dude. I gave him a fucking squeeze consensually, and I went in to kiss her, and she backed off a little bit, you know? So I'm like, okay, hold up, let me re reinvent this shit. I whipped out my dick and started whacking one off and busted her nuts. And she was into it too, dude. She was just like, hey. Make that white stuff come out again. I mean, to be fair, when you're a horny preteen and you're experimenting with other horny preteens, just doing kid shit, 
you know, it's perfectly innocent. But at the same time, you got to teach kids about condoms and safe sex. Otherwise, we're going to continue to have fucking retards in our society. In AD. Yeah. You know, you take what you can get. You get rejected by every chick you've liked since the fourth fucking grade. And then you're hanging out with one of your guy buddies. And he happens to know a chick. And she's totally consenting to show off her titties. It, that's just all innocent kid shit. You know what I'm saying? Moving along from snuggle struggles with buggy boys. At one moment many years ago, Cobra was looking to hook up with some fly ass honeys. Josh was talking about throwing some kind of party and Scotty suggested he could bring some of age strange for the get together. This party never came to fruition because it would have taken some slight modicum of effort on Josh's end and that just isn't gonna fly. Josh uploaded a video explaining that the party just wasn't going to happen, touching on the topic of his loneliness and how he was yearning for social interaction with the fairer sex. He had come to the conclusion that if he built up a protective wall around himself, thus not allowing women to approach him or to make moves of his own, he wouldn't be rejected and therefore couldn't be hurt. Never mind the fact that he was just isolating himself, which leads to the opposite of what he was hoping to achieve. Scotty later told Josh that he knew a girl named Jess who would be down to meet with them at an upcoming party, but it was most likely a troll, an alt of Scotty, or just an outright fabrication. Apparently this Jess person had a lot in common with King Cobra, which is convenient because he's self-conscious around the ladies. They were both goths, have Asperger's, play guitar, and listen to Cradle of Filth, both smoke a tobacco pipe, both live in Casper. There's so many overlapping similarities, they were just meant to be. And of course, nothing ever came from this. However, Scotty did bring up another girl named Bailey who suspiciously fit the same criteria as Jess. Could this be the same person? Did he get her names mixed up? Definitely fun food for thought, but uh, I'll be considering this the next time I forget to take my phone to the crapper. Homeboy Scotty told Cobra that the new girl, Bailey, would be at a party and Josh was invited. Cobra was eager to meet another living creature that could potentially receive his goo in the near future, so he announced his intention to partake in partying on YouTube, only to upload a video soon after where he detailed that the party unfortunately did not happen. Didn't see that one coming. The party was not in Cobra's future, as either the party would get delayed or cancelled, or Scotty was feeling too under the weather to attend which meant that Josh couldn't be brought along which of course impacted Josh's opportunity to meet Bailey and make her his gothic queen. Bailey instead scheduled to host a party of her own, but her dog, Spud, got off his chain and ran for a bit, subsequently getting splattered by a drunk driver. How convenient. Lots of ironic or convenient stuff keeps happening. Are you starting to notice a trend here? Then, right after Spud was turned into a pavement pooch, Bailey changed her phone number because she was getting constantly harassed by telemarketers. And to top it all off, she lost Scotty's number, which further complicated things. In hopes of helping Bailey overcome this pain, Josh contacted his recently deceased dog, Chance, and requested that he contact Bailey's dead dog and give Bailey a sign in her dreams. You heard that right, he was contacting the dog spirit realm. He had no idea if this dream happened or if it would happen later, but his magic certainly would see to it, right? Josh's fans were skeptical of the existence of Bailey, as the similarities between her and Jess were readily apparent, and the stories that Josh shared were certainly more than just far-fetched. King Cobra acknowledged that Scotty's story was a tad questionable, but told his fans not to fret, as they and he would see the truth in due time. Apparently, the dating scene in Casper was pretty slim pickings. Given that Casper, Wyoming is the sewer slide capital of the US, I don't doubt that it's an arduous task to find a suitable mate. Not long after the first party had been cancelled, an announcement weaved its way through the Cobraverse to inform Josh that Bailey was going to host a New Year's Eve party. Again, I must say, how friggin' convenient. Now Josh's window for scoring some consenting non-related poontang was ajar, and he had to climb through the window fast. But this party never happened. Who'd have thunk it, huh? Scotty would later appear in a video with Josh, where he would set the record straight so people would stop accusing him of catfishing his fish-lipped friend. It was abundantly clear that Scotty was on the hot seat and had to come up with nonsense on the fly, which was definitely not his strong suit. Josh's fans accused Scotty of having banged Bailey, but Scotty cleared the air by stating that he would never do the deed with his homeboy's girl, because that is messed up, dude. This comment stood out because he was very much bothered by it, telling the fans to get over it. The point was reiterated a few times, totally not because he was upset that his bluff had been called. So you saying that saying that you are having sex with Bailey and shit? Oh no, I would never fuck a homeboy's girl. I refuse. That's fucked, dude. I got plenty of chicks. Why would I? 
Why? 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 Like, answer me that, y'all. Like, why? When I'm doing good on my own, when I don't need product to. placement with Fanta. But uh, you know, like I'm seriously being truthful. I got him a girl, and some shit has been going down, like some fucked up shit. But hey, life is fucked up, dude. So you know, get over it. Scotty and Cobra also broke the news that the brother of the drunk guy who killed Bailey's dog worked as the driver's alibi, saving him from possible criminal prosecution. Very interesting that they know who crushed the canine, but they can't get any charges to stick. Very strange how that works. You know, like, her fucking dog died and shit. And on top of that, the guy had a fucking alibi. That The drunk driver that killed Bailey's dog had a fucking alibi. So yeah, yeah, that, that pissed me off. Her brother fucking was like... Not her brother, but his brother was like, fucking... Oh, he was here, that didn't happen. Blah, 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 blah. You know, that must have been somebody else. Another similarity to Josh that was revealed was how Bailey was into guns, or at least owned a few, and she possessed a Colt King Cobra that belonged to her grandfather. It had a black and green handle for it, just like how Josh would have loved to have had for himself. Scotty did interject that she was thinking of selling it because she doesn't know guns. Why compound lies on top of lies? If you tell the truth, you never have to remember what you tell somebody. This video did little more than prove that Scotty is full of crap and Josh is pathetically naive. Josh's patience slowly began to wear down as every time he had an avenue to meet Bailey, it would always fall through, and it was always for reasons that were out of his control. Instead of putting together that Scotty was yanking his chain, he instead contemplated whether or not he was asexual. What asexuality and not meeting an imaginary person have in common is beyond me, but bog logic is something of an enigma. Scotty had shown Bailey an image of Cobra and she thought he was a cutie patootie. Josh was taken aback by this, finding it hard to believe that someone as attractive as Bailey would find him alluring. It's almost like, and hear me out here, all the signs that she was a farce were painted on the walls with very bright colors. And then I'm like, all right, I'd definitely like to meet her. And then every time we go to meet, so far it's been, you know, one thing after another, just minor inconveniences that prevent us from meeting. And, you know, it's frustrating to say the least. To Cobra's benefit, if somehow he was unable to make contact with Bailey and hit it off with her, Scotty had a harem of other of-age bitches that he could line up at the opportunity to sleep with the rock star villain like Jord. Regardless of Josh slowly figuring out that something wasn't quite right about this Bailey chick, Scotty returned for another visit to declare his innocence of any wrongdoing. I feel like I'm being redundant in repeating myself here, but the cycle started again, and Scotty went on and on and on and on about how he would never leave Joshua astray. Cobra believed his homeboy despite evidence pointing towards him being dead wrong. If, assuming, Bailey decides to host the party. I'm pretty sure she does, and like she said, dude, if she doesn't, she still wants to hang out with you, so. See? There you go, YouTube. If that's not proof enough, I don't know what is. Do I have to cut off my fucking hip? Do I have to fucking rip off my fucking hip and show you? Because I don't think I have the capability or the power to do so. Several months would pass before Bailey would become a fading memory in the Cobraverse. Before her departure from the lore, Josh said and did the following. Sat on his rear end and demanded that people respect him, Scotty, and Bailey. Claimed that Scotty knew where Bailey lived, but conveniently would never bring Josh to her or vice versa, let alone exchange their phone numbers. Took issue with people impersonating Bailey in his comments. Received info from Scotty that Bailey was at the mall with him, the one time Josh decided not to go. Expressed his interest in purchasing a love doll if things with Bailey don't work out. And of course, in the end, Bailey and Josh never met. It's almost like she never actually existed. Funny thing, that. When Bailey started to become a fleeting memory to Josh, Scotty introduced the same kind of conceptual goth girl to him once more, this time under the name of Izzy. She was a fabricated character that was supposedly the friend and roommate of one of Scotty's fuck buddies. I have many questions about Scotty's ability to pull women, but this isn't about me. She was one of the many other girls that Scotty had on the back burner for Cobra, just in case Bailey turned out to be a disappointment. Turns out Izzy had the following traits that Josh was quite excited for. She was 21 years old, which was close to his age at the time. She was goth, obviously. She had dark hair, which was a plus. She had green eyes, which the boy loves because the color green is so goth, dude. She played guitar, probably better than Josh, but that doesn't take much skill to pull off. 
Despite the glaring similarities between Izzy and Bailey, Josh was already playing out exaggerated scenarios in his mind. He alleged that he was waiting for his tax return to come in so he'd have enough money to take her out on a date. Where, you ask? Oh, you know, the finest establishments available in Casper. Taco Bell, Wendy's, Burger King, that kind of stuff. The sort of places that are guaranteed to get any coochie gooey. After spilling the beans about similarities between Bailey and Izzy, Josh detailed a bit of information regarding the forthcoming double date between Scotty and his fuck buddy and Cobes and Izzy. Jord was understandably nervous about making a good first impression because he was so tired of being lonely and depressed. If this date turned out to be a failure or Cobra got rejected somehow, he was prepared to give up on the dating scene altogether. He figured that we all die alone anyway, so why not just cut out the middleman and live a life of solitude so there's no way he could love and lose. Well, if I get rejected on this date, then I'm giving up on dating. Simple as that. Like, it, it hurts too much, man, you know? If things were really going to collapse, Cobes truly saw this as the end of his tenure as a bachelor, because he was ready to give up on relationships, sex, interacting with the honeys, and all of the other finer points of trying to find a mate. He wasn't even going to save up for a rubber lover, which meant he was serious. But let's be real here, there's no way he was going to do all of this without cranking his hog. He closed his eyes and conjured spirits to inquire about the fate of his upcoming date. He hummed a bit, contacting the dead, getting all of the information needed to make a well-informed decision as to whether or not he should pursue his date with Izzy. The spirits told him to be cautious and to be aware of his surroundings, but he was going to enjoy the experience regardless. Well, let me use my magic powers. Let me sit here and ask the recently deceased about this date. Hmm, let me ask the spirits. Hmm. Very interesting, YouTube. The spirits have spoken to me inside my head, and they have said that to be cautious and be aware of your surroundings but at the same time that I was going to enjoy it, that I'm going to enjoy this date. That's reassuring. Days would pass until Cobes' date with Izzy. The day after the date was supposed to have taken place, Cobra went to YouTube to complain about the date having not happened. Who would have guessed that it was all a big nothing burger? Not me. He didn't want to see any comments from people who called the date being a bunch of crap. To put it simply, he was a little agitated. From what Cobra shared, the girl that Scotty had been knocking boots with couldn't make up her mind about whether or not she wanted to be his friend with benefits or his girlfriend, which made Joshua jealous. The gothic bad boy was getting increasingly frustrated with the lack of development in his romantic endeavors. The convenient occurrences were also starting to pile up and make things abundantly clear that something just wasn't right. This date meant so much to him. He had been looking forward to it for weeks, being the only driving force that pushed him through the arduous task of doing his job and living all of those tumultuous things. He should have just had VJJ falling into his lap because of the lengthy list of his perfect traits. I should have pussy just falling into my lap, you know what I'm saying? By all accounts, YouTube, I should have pussy falling into my lap right now. I'm attractive, I have big muscles, I have a big penis, I can sing. I play guitar. What the fuck? All of those things are dead wrong. How can somebody be incorrect nearly 100% of the time? Josh was beyond tired. He didn't want to keep waiting for letdown after letdown. In a fit of desperation, he created a profile on OkCupid and matched up with a local girl who just so happened to fit all of his criteria and desires in a partner. He never revealed the name of this individual, but alongside this, nothing ever came from it either. A date was scheduled, but she never appeared. Go figure. This caused more problems for Cobra because Izzy supposedly caught wind of what Josh was doing, and because she believed that he was interested in other people, decided to go on a date with another man who probably didn't smell half as good as he did. Josh went to the fair with his homeboys Scotty and Joe, moseying around and harassing the other vagrants that inhabited the area. He recorded himself venting his frustrations while at the fair. He wanted a girl so bad, but it just wasn't going to happen. He even said that he felt unattractive. The poor guy. All these dates getting canceled on me. I'm feeling sexually unattractive right now. I'm not going to lie, you two. Josh would continue to be strung around by Scotty, fed a bunch of nonsense that led to nothing. Somehow, Josh felt it necessary to defend Scotty until the bitter end. Let's roll back the clock again, shall we? There's so many directions his love life has taken, we could jump to any year and find something depraved going on. For example, 
Cobra went on a date with an unspecified woman in early 2015. According to him, despite some minor setbacks, such as him accidentally spilling his drink on her outfit, the date went pretty well overall. They went out to dinner and decided to skip out on dessert in favor of heading back to his place. One thing led to another and the two began exploring each other's bodies. She removed all of her clothes, waiting for Cobra to do the same. Now, bear with me here. He claims that once he removed his pants, she saw his dangling doodads and she refused to let him sleep with her because his meat stick was too big. He offered to be gentle but she vehemently refused entry. She put her clothes back on and left, but not before telling him that if he made more money and his dick was smaller, she would consider going out with him, whatever the hell that actually means. I pulled out my pants and she looks down at my cock and she says, oh hell no. I said, whoa, 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 what? And she goes, that's way too big. That ain't going anywhere near me. Maybe for you, but shit, I'll, I'll be gentle. And she goes, no, 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 this isn't going to work out for us. When she basically put her clothes on and left. And as she was leaving, this is what she told me. She said, if you made more money and your dick was smaller, I'd consider going out with you. Yeah. I'm sitting there, she left, pondering that for a second, going, hmm, well, you're lost then. His already stained perception of women caused him plenty of grief in the dating scene, and he feared that he may have to live life on his own because his penis is too big. He smells too good, and girls can't handle him. His friends would try to make him feel better by suggesting they could hook him up with some girls they knew, but Cobes wasn't feeling it. It's a shame that nobody in Casper was seemingly fit to be his gothic queen. Due to his struggles with dating and his friends lying about girls that don't exist having an interest in him, Cobra's relationship with the dating scene got trickier with every passing day, allotting him plenty of time to be spent coping and telling it like it is on the YouTube. He didn't want to have to spend the next five years of his prime being single. In late 2016, a troll sent Cobra a flashlight. He said he hadn't used it, and played dumb when it came to unscrewing the top to reveal the pecker sleeve. George said he thought a fan sent him a pocket pussy, like it was some kind of revelation. How did he know that's what it could be without having opened it prior? It's almost like he might have already taken it for a test drive before showing it off on camera. Cobra claimed a few times that he wasn't comfortable with sex anymore, not requiring a toy to alleviate his tension. So much so that he was going to destroy the adult pleasure utility on camera without the use of his Cobra. You like what I did there? I'm pretty proud of it. He took a pair of scissors and stuck one of the blades in the hole and began pumping away, slicing it down the middle. Cutting it up wasn't enough, he had to get his hands in there to split it open for the camera, demonstrating his strength and the precision of his fingers. How dare his trolls try to help him relieve stress? A compartment coochie is not a substitute for love, troll. He did appreciate that somebody cared enough to send him a tool to help him with his problems. However, he no longer had a sex drive and didn't feel the need to beat his meat. His desire for a woman in his life was such a heavy burden that he tried to say he had the taste of clean cooch on his tongue because he wanted it so bad he could taste it. I shit you not. The destruction of the toy ultimately mattered very little as he fixed it not long after with what appeared to be electrical tape. All of that because he felt bad that a fan sent it to him and he destroyed it so hastily. Shortly after revealing that he had repaired it, he also confessed that he'd actually used it as soon as he got it. I called it. Turns out he broke it because he wasn't sure if he liked sex or not, and he felt like he wasn't good enough to receive it. He was going to keep it because someone gave it to him and it was the right thing to do. Right. A need for a partner is a totally reasonable issue when we all face this at some point. Cobra was taking it all quite hard and didn't see much of a light at the end of the tunnel. It appeared that maybe his cries for help were for nothing. Who could help him? How could they even begin to do so? Why couldn't he help himself? Some time would pass, and at one point, Cobra's adoring fans would send him a sex doll, and he was tickled pink by it. Now he had some pink to tickle himself with his penis. After the initial stage of flattery was over, he began porking it regularly and sharing his stories with his fan base. However, he eventually had to upload a disheartening video where he detailed the passing of the doll. During the process, his gargantuan meat tore a gash in the doll's gash, which allegedly made him feel embarrassed and frustrated. He broke his sex toy by having sex with it. He lifted up the severed face of the silicone slave, revealing that he had brutalized it in a fit of autistic rage. He couldn't fix the doll's mangled snatch, which meant that it deserved to die. Punishment by evisceration. He intended to use this lacerated doll for a comedy skit, but it would not have been as funny for the reasons he intended for it to be. So of course I was having sex with it, and then my dick tore a huge gash in the vagina, and... I was embarrassed and frustrated that I couldn't fix it and that, well, nice going, dumbass. You broke your fuck toy, fucking it of all things. Just know, just know that I am here 
for you guys, my fans and my friends. What I did was eerie, yeah, but let's let's face it, people, let's face it. I'm gonna get a lot of hate for this, I know. I know. The commotion in his love ocean had him down in the dumps. No man should have to bury his lover, even if he did tear it apart piece by piece. He was feeling this deep in his heart, as he shared with his viewers that he even cuddled with a doll before he put it out to pasture. Josh described it as feeling lifelike during the cuddles, but I can't imagine that a cold, sticky surface is the same as a soft, warm body. What kind of bodies has he previously been cuddling up to? And it, it, that sex doll legitimately made me happy, YouTube. You had no idea. Cuddling with it was very lifelike, yes. Just knowing that I broke it because I fucked it too hard. You know, that... I, I don't even... I don't even know YouTube. By the time the idea of a fun-sized silicone playmate entered Cobra's mind, he had already suggested that he was ready to give up on dating because women kept rejecting him and he just couldn't get his way. He wanted to focus his life on his guitar playing and his fans making dank food hacks and drink combos and polishing his pole. King Cobra uploaded a video to YouTube showing him perusing a site for love doll purchasing, selecting the customization options that best suited his desires, totaling over $2,500. The weight of his regret for the destruction of his previous rubber slit was weighing heavy on his shoulders, and now his heart had an open wound which could only be filled by another silicone doll. I just gotta say, why did he feel the need to buy a doll? He's already got a perfectly good dummy that he could fill up with his baby gravy. Sometime after showing off the website with his choices, a fan wrote and sent a heartfelt letter to the gothic bad boy. This letter was emotionally driven, expressing a fondness of Cobra and sharing how the author felt bad that Josh was hurting over the loss of his previous doll. They declared that they were going to send Joshua yet another doll to help him tend to his broken heart and aching balls. This was merely a letter to warn him that it was going to take a while for the author to put enough money together to get the jizz depositing apparatus, but assured him that they love and support him. Cobra got in contact with the author, who was going by the pseudonym of Mad Dog Kurt, and entered an email correspondence with them. Kurt wanted Josh to upload a video detailing the doll that he wanted and what specific options he'd like to go along with it. Cobes, of course, fell for the obvious bait and showed the website on social media yet again. Sometime later, the doll finally arrived at the Cobra Lair, fitting his specifications for the most part despite missing the wig he desired. The doll was a fun-sized model, meaning that it was very tiny. He made it a point to bring up that he was sent a small doll, but he wasn't complaining. The doll came with a selection of supplies, such as a cleaning kit, a hairbrush, a pair of handling gloves, a heating rod to help warm the insides to give the illusion that you're plowing a real person, touch oil, Johnson's baby powder, an extra outfit that barely fits its frame, and an additional head in case he somehow loses or maims the first one. At the request of his fans, the Cobro initiated another episode of Sean and Saunders featuring Fun Size Felicia. He'd grab her little rubber lips and move them to simulate talking. That's what she said. <laughs> Shut up, Sean. <laughs> She's kind of short. I'm not short, I'm fun sized. Ugh. Man, he's such a good ventriloquist. He doesn't look creepy or depraved at all. I wonder if Sean got the opportunity to tag team Felicia with Josh. Ah, <laughs> crap. He actually proposed it. Can we tag team her? What? You, me, and your new bitch. Can we tag team that shit? I'm sorry, Sean, but I need a real man to please me. And you're not real enough for me. <sighs> when speaking through Felicia, he'd refer to himself as Babe, his mind already set on the future he and his new woman would pursue. Despite this, Felicia expressed an attraction to Sean because they're both dolls. Sean rejected her, stating that her poorly fit wig kept falling off and Josh suffered from quote trichoteria, so they're perfect for each other. Imagine being cucked by a dummy. Trichoteria is a cobrism for trichotillomania, a disorder where people feel an intense urge to pull their hair out of their head. This is typically to relieve stress. Regardless, they still tried things, but it's good, because the relationship burned up almost as fast as cobras tend to with Felicia breaking things off with Sean because, of course, he, unlike Josh, lacks a penis. Josh then turned Felicia's head to face his, forcing her to describe needing his member in her fun-sized fanny. He's living his fucking dream, dude. Not long after this, Cobra uploaded a video detailing the pros and cons of owning a love doll, in his opinion. Josh received a question from a fan, inquiring about whether or not Cobra would let his homeboys bang Felicia or if he would treat her like a real woman, keeping her to himself. Josh's response was profound. 
Serious question, would you share your sex doll with friends like homeboy Scotty or would you treat it more like a girlfriend? And of course my answer was, i treat her like my queen and my girlfriend, she would be my silicone goddess. When it came to defining the positive parts of owning a rubber lover, he stated the first pro was that the doll could never say no. This is a problem that some men have with some women, probably because they're creepy. Just something to consider is all. Next up, dolls don't come with a bitchy mother-in-law who nitpick you and hurt your feelings. Emotions never really have to run high when you have a subservient silicone soul sucker. To top it all off, Felicia isn't pregnant and she couldn't harbor any STIs. Not counting the ones he likely gave to her, but still. However, it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows. The cons eventually had to rear their ugly heads, too. The first issue is that the doll couldn't love you back, mainly because it's a bunch of metal and silicone. She couldn't dig into your back with her nails while you're taking her to Pound Town, and she can't bite your neck with every thrust. She also couldn't carry a conversation unless you're schizophrenic. It's hard to find love in the modern age. Technology can be so, so cold. Cobra confirmed that he still intended to purchase a much more expensive model from the website mentioned prior, but it would be a while before he would be able to afford to purchase one himself. This relationship would go titties up, just as all the ones prior did as well. Because fun-sized Felicia tragically passed away at the hands of Joshua, who improperly cleaned her with soap that caused her silicone body to melt away. It's not shocking that he somehow managed to kill a second doll. Josh claimed to use organic, super heavy-duty antibacterial soap, which caused the silicone to melt away quickly. Apparently, if his hands get covered in pipe ash and he happens to touch her bare skin, the ash gets in deep into her skin and it becomes hard to wash out. It makes sense why he was scrubbing her so rigorously, well, that and the fluids he likely just finished depositing in her. He took the time to over-explain why he told the story of her death, because he felt stupid. Now, I'm not a psychologist, I'm definitely not even close to being a scholar, but I do pick up on some projection here. He probably got mad and killed her. He couldn't possibly have fallen to the plight of his wet brain again. He would touch on this topic again at a later point, trying to suggest that a troll told him to clean Felicia with dish soap, but that ultimately led to her demise. Such a sad story. In his mind, this was karma for having destroyed the toys that were sent to him previously. This was fine because like he stated earlier, he had his boner set on another doll, so this was no skin off his corroded teeth. But he never ended up getting the doll, just as expected. Cobra's interpersonal relationships have always been shaky, and unfortunately they rarely lead to anything romantic in nature, mainly because Cobra only hangs out with guys. This didn't stop one of his close pals from getting a bit handsy with him, possibly opening up a potential fling for the two if Josh wasn't so hung up on his fragile sexuality. Alex Campbell, better known as Warlord Alex and briefly as Sasha, was a friend of Josh's for many years. He's your typical Casper Denizen who loves to get high and drunk, destroying what little bit of life he actually still has. Alex is certainly no stranger to nonsensical drug-induced escapades, having many children that he fails to provide for, many women who are left wanting his support, and likely a few warrants that could keep him held down for a long time. He's renowned in the Cobra community for being an annoying mooch who provides nothing good to Cobra's existence, other than causing a good handful or two of meltdowns that consistently entertain the masses. Despite the two being good friends, Alex was a bit more affectionate towards Cobes than the other way around, which led to some awkward situations. He'd often bring booze for the two to share with varying levels of hospitality and success, but Alex would also mooch free food when he could. Somehow, the dank food hacks weren't a turnoff for him, must have been the crank or something. But yeah, Alex did seem to love Cobra and what he could do for him, if you catch my drift. For example, Alex joined Josh for a StreamYard broadcast where the two got progressively more inebriated while streaming with the Witch from the Web. At the beginning of this stream, Josh shared that Alex had changed his name to Sasha and whatnot. I'm going to use masculine pronouns here because this was just a drug and alcohol-fueled phase that inevitably got dropped later on, with Alex going back to his birth name and gender and what have you. Crystal, the calcified lagoon creature hosting the show, saw Alex in the back and told him to shut up, because she had a job to do. She had to talk to a drunk. During this stream, Warlord kept getting touchy-feely with Josh, rubbing on him, getting close and cuddling up, all of the hallmarks of an intimate relationship. This, coupled with the intoxicated ramblings of Alex, made for quite the spectacle of a show. At one point, he told Crystal that he wanted to slip his tongue in her butt. Very classy. Schnapps, courtesy of... Warlord Campbell, who now prefers to be called Sasha. Yes. Is yeah. that Warlord talking in the background? Hey, Sasha, oh. pipe down. Sit down, pipe down, be quiet. I'm doing a show here, Sasha. This is uh, Crystal Roberts. I woke up to this shit. 
What the fuck is this? She's a friend of mine. She wanted me to stream with her. I was streaming with Crystal. Okay, guys, stick my tongue up her ass. That's okay. okay. Wait, can you do what? Can you do what up my ass? My ass? I can stick my tongue up your ass. No! God, no! Why would you want to do that? That's a shithole. Why? Of course it's a shithole, but I still want to my tongue up that ass. The two would inevitably have a falling out, with Josh failing to see that the perfect person to end his dry spell was sitting right next to him. Perhaps if he lowered his standards, he and Alex could have had a beautiful life together. Oh well. In recent years, Cobra's life has taken an even more depressing turn. His friends are seemingly gone or at least have been keeping a bit of distance from him. His streams are constant topic loops where he whines about gender relations and of course shares his insight on the task of making mead, or rather bog hooch. His disdain for his dry spell has gotten more intense and as such, God had no choice but to shine light upon Cobra, not leading him to the promised land but instead to some of age consenting non-related human fragrant coochie a fangirl that was actually willing to pursue a relationship with him. Jessica Boyle, known better by her web handle Naked and Laughing, is one such individual who is capable of handling the stench of the mighty bonglum. She and Jord have a lot in common. In fact, she learned of Josh because of his online infamy, deciding that not only does she find him attractive, but she wanted to be with him physically. Now that's dedication. Jessica is a somewhat notoriously unpopular person online. By that, I mean everybody who stumbles upon her seems to find her behavior revolting. She has been involved in a plethora of uninteresting girl drama on the web, and made a pretty awful name for herself. Her reputation is mostly that she's a bit promiscuous, having carried herself with a boorish attitude. She had a brief stint as a cam girl, showing off her frumpy face and body, and she's pulled off countless, now deleted, drinking streams. A style of content that isn't terribly different from Cobra. She spent a few months garnering the Cobra community's attention because she was trying to get a hold of Joshua. The official King Cobra JFS subreddit showed an immediate disdain for her. The fans and trolls started interacting with her. They asked her questions in chat and began needling her when possible. When this got limited results, cops were called and she'd mouth off to them. How could this possibly go wrong? Many viewers are under the belief that she takes hard drugs, like meth. Because of this, she's been nicknamed Methica. Gotta admit, that's a good one. It did not take long for Josh to take notice of her, seeming somewhat unsure at first, but their bond quickly formed with the two modding each other on their respective channels and eventually chatting outside of YouTube. She proposed the idea of flying out to see Cobes, but she and Cobra both lack the funds necessary because both of them are lazy schlubs that can't do anything without the assistance of other people they don't personally know. Because the Cobra community loves a good dumpster fire, someone decided to foot the bill and get Jessica out to Casper just in time for Valentine's Day. It appeared that 2024 was going to be quite the exciting year for Josh's fans. Jessica arrived in Casper and immediately banged Jord as soon as they both entered his humble but stinky abode. The sex was undoubtedly mediocre and the stench likely made the paint peel off the walls. And thus, the dry spell had finally ended after many grueling years of sitting patiently and waiting. I can't believe Josh's plan actually worked. Josh went live after a little bit of hanky-panky with Massacre, sporting a shit-eating grin, proud of himself for having successfully ended his dry spell. Jessica also appeared in the video feed, holding down the couch so it couldn't run away. The two bragged about copulating as if anybody was jealous that either person slept with such vile creatures. The trolls are so fucking mad that Jessica's here. I fucking love it, dude. And he, if you weren't mad, you wouldn't be spamming my chat with lies. What are they saying? Fuck R. Kelly. He pissed on a little girl. It's so fucking disgusting, dude. Well, that's true, though. That, that's not the lie. R. Kelly is broke. <laughs> yeah, the trolls are going to try as hard as they can to fuck this up because they're so jealous they can't get laid. And it's like, dude. I don't spend all day harassing my YouTube trolls. I just do my own thing. And look what it gets me. I'm YouTube famous and I got a chick on my lap. What the fuck are you doing with your life? From that point forward until she left, they would routinely stream together while intoxicated and coming down from swallowing dubious pills. What made the subsequent streams interesting is that Josh was very clearly tired of her shit by the second day. She'd complain about people in chat, take control of his mouse to mute people, bitch about fangirl Kate, one of his moderators before she demodded them, the whole nine yards. This isn't acceptable behavior because it isn't her channel, not her computer to use, and she was recently banned from YouTube for her crass behavior. Jessica would continuously pick at him, touching his face, demanding his attention. Meanwhile, he was pounding while trying to suggest that she wasn't bugging him, but he wears his heart on his sleeve. We could tell how he really felt. 
Her overall behavior was most annoying to viewers as she was, simply put, loud and obnoxious. Whenever the cops would show up or she went to do something, she'd cover the camera and mute the mic. How dare she teach the boy such a strat? Cobra's hetero life mate and homeboy Darth Lenny appeared on a stream with both Jessica and Josh, but they seemingly ignored him for most of the broadcast. Such a shame, really. We had not seen him in a great while and when he did return to the fray, Jessica had to take over the stream yet again, leaving him to sit awkwardly in silence. Darth Lenny didn't seem too keen on Jessica's presence due to this. He likely shares the same opinions of her that the wider community does. He's a real one. It's like watching a bit of Cobra history re-manifest, but the good times are long since over, and we just have to accept that. It really puts the dire situation into perspective when you think about it. Josh has less people in his circle than ever. He hardly hangs out with friends, let alone has many to begin with. His life revolves around antics that always leave him in the negative. He is the only person in his life who could fix this, but he's scraping by with less than the bare minimum, and he's okay with that. Good lord, that's gotta be a hard way to live, but I guess he's happy. On one stream, Jessica took over his channel while Joshi was passed out in his chair after popping some pills. She livestreamed herself responding to Chad as he was fading in and out of reality. This concerned fans and trolls alike as it appeared that perhaps he was overdosing, and as expected, law enforcement was summoned to perform a wellness check. She had a meltdown and nothing was solved. She did, however, prove that she was a negative influence on his life. Cobes went on the defense and put on a false bravado to protect her from the hateful actions of the trolls. Calling the cops on me and Jessica because you can't handle it. Jessica's here and it makes you so mad that girl Cobra's our girlfriend. You know, well, they do the same shit to me when I, they, uh, literally, well, I don't Look, know. Okay, you see Cobra's live, I'm doing things okay, so why the fuck you gotta bug me? Like, well, I don't want to assume everyone knows I'm live, but as soon as I'm live, they like, and then maybe, I have maybe to. Maybe they don't know. No, I'm live, so I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. Right. It's like, dude, I'm strange. No, I know, and it irritates the fuck out of me, and then I gotta mute the shit, and then, so if and I don't... And wonder why I don't go live. Like, oh, I wish you'd go live. Well, I wish you could bug me every time I try to go live. I got the EMTs and the cops showing up, fucking. Uh, oh, you okay, Cobra? I'm like, I'm fucking fine, dude. She left after about a week of bothering Jord and derailing his streams. This was great because many feared she was going to find some kind of excuse to stay home and move in with the Rockstar villain. I sincerely hope this never happens. She's unbelievably annoying. Upon her returning home, she started to allude to being pregnant, posting a photo of her supplement regimen to her newest channel. The photo included prenatal vitamins. The fans were immediately shocked and called her out for it, but of course nothing ever came from this. Some people have speculated that she wants to lock Joshua down with a child, but that kid would get taken away so quickly, it's not hard to see why. I mean, just look at how they both act. If the child didn't go into the system, it'd have to be cared for by Clint. We've all seen how well he did with Josh, but maybe George's turnout was a freak accident. Another handful of onlookers believed that she might have been pregnant prior to going out to see him. Looking back now, I can see why it was hard to say at the time, but come on. I believe if she was actually pregnant and the bog seed was forming into a homunculus inside her, we would have had some better proof of it. A baby bump or something. I don't know. At the time of making this video, Jessica already returned to Casper and made a gigantic ass out of herself, abusing Josh and causing plenty of trouble for his neighbors. I have many doubts that she will make a third return after this most recent visit. She had a wonderful selection of enthralling meltdown live streams at the Cobra Lair, and I'm sure there were plenty more terrible things that we didn't get the chance to see. I didn't fucking see this blonde haired fucking fucking Z tit fucking whore cleaning his fucking kitchen. I didn't see this whore cleaning his kitchen and sucking his dick and washing his walls, but he'll jack off to her. <laughs> I didn't see her cleaning his fucking kitchen. I didn't see this fucking whore cleaning his kitchen, did I? No, the fuck I didn't. Could you please stop yelling, Jessica? Will you stop? You're the one that chose not to get it. Stop. And stop. I asked you guys, could you please stop yelling at me? That's all I did. I'm not yelling at you! Right now you're yelling. You want me to fix this plumbing? I wish I could if I was a millionaire. <laughs> This is in my apartment! Oh, the one that makes zero money should do everything for Josh and fix everything in his life. No, Josh is a capable, grown human being. Thank you.
She's harassed Josh and Sean, screamed at Cobra for jerking his meat, broken the tank to his toilet, caused a laundry machine in his complex to start backing up with water, and generally just being her usual messy self. All of her antics, coupled with Josh's inability to do anything right, resulted in him getting eviction notice on his birthday, March 26, 2024. What a beautiful way to round out this newest chapter in the saga of love. If something incredible or major happens, I'm sure I'll be discussing the latest news on one of my live streams or, if it's big enough, it'll get its own video. For the best up-to-date content on King Cobra, I highly recommend the channels Boglum Chronicles and Bite Size Cobra Vids. The efforts of those two and the many other clipping channels out there should not go unthinked. Without their tireless effort to archive and condense Cobra's videos, Jordan and his merry band of misfits would be much harder to digest. Really, the entire Cobra community's dedication to documenting the happenings of everyone's favorite highly regarded individual should be commended. I don't know where Josh's story will lead next, but I'm confident it will be bad for him. But I am sure it will at least be entertaining for everyone who decides to watch the slow burn. I just hope they can stomach the inevitable topic loops, but it is what it is, YouTube. That is most definitely what's up. But that being said, that's going to be it for today's video. If you like what I do, leave a comment, rate, and subscribe. If you want to support me in a more personal way, you can check out the Patreon link and the Teespring link in the description. I've got more content coming down the pipeline. But until then, I'll see you degenerates next time.